And welcome to this week's engineering announcements from the IBA. NICAM Digital Stereo. Bruce Randall talks to Graham Sordi, the IBA's head of telecoms development, about some of the problems we've experienced with its introduction. On the radio front, there's a site move for 2CR's VHF transmitter and new incremental stations for Belfast and Bristol. In transmitter news, there's a summary of this week's special announcements affecting existing stations. And 20 years of IBA pocket guides, the latest and last one eagerly awaited by everyone and his dog. But first, Bruce Randall talks to Graham Sawley about the realities of NICAM. Graham, it's, it's about a year now since we first started uh, transmitting tests on NICAM. Um, I think it's fair to say now that we're in service, that there have been a few uh, hiccups along the way, a few uh, teething troubles, wouldn't you say? Now, is that really something we could have anticipated and did we rush into it maybe before we were quite ready? Well, the six months of tests, I would agree with you, there were some teething troubles as you put it. They were after all test transmissions and we were using a completely new transmission system and we were not only broadcasting NICAM, we were networking the signals in digital form from the studio centres. That was really the purpose of the test transmissions, to iron out all the, pro the uh, problems and allow our equipment developers to get the equipment working perfectly. What caused the, the clicks and pops and mutes that we've been having? Well, in the early days, we actually were not running with a complete system. We had only prototype equipment, and parts of the system were not even actually in place. Uh, this is why we got clicks when we had digital errors on the transmission links. Now we have equipment that stops that. The BBC have been doing experimental NICAM from Crystal Palace for a number of years now. Why don't they have these kind of problems? Well, I can't really speak for the BBC, but I think what they've been doing is simply to have a NICAM encoder at the transmitter fed with an analog signal. Um, in contrast, as I said, we've been taking a digital signal all the way from the studio right through to the viewer's home in a rather more elaborate system, really a forerunner of what we intend to use around the network. I do believe that in their final system, when they're networking countrywide, the BBC are going to use something very akin to what we've been doing. Now, we're using uh, a dual-channel sound and sync system to get uh, signals from studio to studio and from studio to transmitter. Now, how have you managed to get uh, twice the amount of data uh, compared to the old mono sound and sync days? Well, as you say, mono sound and sync has been around for some years, since the late 60s. And in stereo, we have a data burst in the sync period but instead of it being binary data, we have four-level data so that each symbol conveys two bits of information and thereby virtually doubling the data capacity and allowing us to carry two channels of digital audio. Doubling the error rate, potentially? Possibly. Well, it, certainly you're putting more information into the same system, so the potentiality for errors is greater. But However, electronics has moved on in 20 years and there's much more sophisticated techniques can be used to avoid that. Now, you've got a complete system here on the bench. Um, it's an awful lot of kit to be installed, but uh, what, what actual uh, units go in, in which location? Well, these units are the SIS encoders. Uh, actually, each unit consists of a NICAM 728 encoder together with a bit of circuitry which puts the 728 kilobit serial data into burst, right. bursts of data in the vision sync pulses. That's the way the signal leaves the studio and gets carried around the network to the transmitting stations. Now here we have the equipment that's used at the transmitter. This is the sound and sync decoder which extracts the data from the sync pulses and converts it back to 728 kilobits serial data. That data is then decoded by LSI chips, much the same as are used in a domestic TV to feed the sound to the FM transmitters. But the s digital signal is also fed to this unit here, which is a QPSK modulator, which provides the 6.552 megahertz QPSK modulated subcarrier, which is added to the transmission. That's the actual signal which carries the digital audio to the home? That's correct. It, it, once it 
It has to be up converted to the final frequency and power amplified, but basically, yes, that's the signal. Up here, we have a changeover unit, which is basically to control the... We have duplicate systems of Sysdecoder and modulators so that faults can be coped with and repairs made without putting the service off the air. And this unit monitors the units and performs the changeovers. So there's quite a bit of equipment to go into each main station, but uh, wouldn't it have been better if we'd tried to have a, a big bang launch for the whole country at one, in one go? Well, we could have uh, launched, as you say, a, a big bang at the end of the year. In fact, this was our original plan. We would have launched the service at the end of this year to 75% of the population. But there were quite a lot of NICAM receivers coming onto the market, and there was quite a demand from Bremer to actually have some signals broadcast. So in the end, we agreed to launch our service on an area-by-area -area basis as each ITV contractor became ready to transmit. A lot of people ask why there can't be a stereo mono indicator mode for NICAM. After all, the, the receivers do tend to label or have displays on screen about stereo and mono. Well, uh, it is true to say that there, is, there are four modes of the NICAM system. That's stereo, dual language, mono plus data, and all data. And we can operate in any of those modes. However, most of the programming is mono or stereo. And we don't want to do unnecessary switching. After all, mono is really a, a subset of stereo with, stereo with no uh, different signal. So we much prefer to stay in the stereo mode more normally and just go to the other modes should we actually want to transmit dual mono or mono plus data. It's, it's true to say that there haven't actually been all that many programs transmitted in stereo. Uh, is there a technical reason for that or is it just something which will gradually build up as the year moves on? Oh, undoubtedly. Um, obviously, program makers have a very large stock of existing material, all of which is in mono. Um, also, it takes time to commission new material. There was, at the early stages, some fear over the additional cost of stereo, but I think experience has shown, Channel 4 have said that the additional cost is well under half of a percent, so that's not really a major factor. But with the broadcasting bill and the possibility of auctioning franchises, obviously ITV companies have been very nervous about spending any extra money in that scenario. So this has perhaps delayed the production of as many stereo programs as we'd have liked to see. Graham, all very enlightening. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you, Bruce. Bruce Randall talking to the IBA's Mr. NICAM, Graham Sordi. And last Friday, the Wenvo transmitter in South Wales, together with all its 72 relays, started radiating NICAM signals on a test basis on ITV and S4C. The tests, which initially will be only in mono, will consist of normal program sound, but they may have to be interrupted occasionally for engineering purposes until the full NICAM stereo service begins at the end of April. Normal mono FM sound won't be affected. Due to start NICAM tests in a month or so, Mendip in the West Country and Winter Hill in Lancashire. Both of these stations are due in official NICAM service on the 25th of May. And for those who are getting NICAM, don't forget that engineering announcements is in glorious stereo every week. Indispensable for keeping track of NICAM, RDS, news stations and a plethora of other transmitter information is the 1990 Pocket Guide to Transmitting Stations, which is published this week. It will, of course, be the last in a long line of IBA Pocket Guides, which have evolved from this simple eight-page folded card dating from 1970. The guide took on its more familiar shape within a couple of years, the number of pages growing with new services and features, until this latest edition of over 60 pages. Inside, you'll find all the usual television information with a new, clearer presentation, and there's a lot of detail in the radio section with information about split programming and the new community-style stations. If you'd like a copy of the 1990 Pocket Guide, please send us a stamped addressed envelope of at least 11 by 22 centimetres to our usual address coming up at the end. But please mark the envelope PG90. This week's transmitter news, starting with Channel 4 from Dover, which is remaining on half aerial while we investigate an aerial problem affecting a few areas of Dover. And in the Peak District, the Culver Peak Relay continues on reduced power on all four channels pending BBC aerial repairs. 
Today, tomorrow and Thursday, all channels from Nottingham may be interrupted between 8.30 a.m. and 4.30 p.m. while the electricity board works on the supply feeding the relay. In North Wales, all television channels from the Moyley Park and Llandono transmitters and their relays will be liable to interruptions from 9 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. today during electricity board work at the link station feeding Moyley Park. In Cumbria, the Austin relay will be off from 1 until 3 this afternoon for the electricity board to complete some work from yesterday. Tomorrow, the East Grinstead relay in West Sussex will be off between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. for electricity board work. In Yorkshire, the Addingham relay in Wharfdale will be off tomorrow morning from 9 until 11 for electricity board work. In the Peak District, the Ashford in the Water relay near Bakewell will be off tomorrow from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. for electricity board work. And finally, looking ahead to next Monday, and in Snowdonia, the Thlandequin and Festiniog relays will be off from 9.30 a.m. to 3.30 p.m., again for electricity board work. Independent local radio now and 2CR at Bournemouth have a new VHF transmitter at Nine Barrow Down near Swanage. This transmitter on 102.3 MHz with a mixed polarization is now on test in mono with full stereo program service due at 6 a.m. on Thursday. The new transmitter, which is also more powerful than the original one, has been designed with the aim of generally improving the VHF FM coverage for about 610,000 listeners. The VHF service should now extend to some areas such as Blandford Forum and the outskirts of Lymington, which were previously only served on medium wave. The VHF transmitter at Paul on 97.2 MHz is due to close down on the 13th of April. Next, incremental radio and Belfast Community Radio on 96.7 MHz with vertical polarization from the Black Mountain main television transmitter is now on test. Programs by and for the Belfast community of about 700,000 are due to start on the 6th of April. For the People Radio in Bristol is scheduled to start tests on the 26th of March with programs from the 7th of April. FTP will transmit a range of black music aimed mainly at the Afro-Caribbean and Asian communities from Purr Down to the northeast of the city on 97.2 MHz with vertical polarization. And that's all for this week, but do get in touch if you have any technical queries on independent broadcasting or would like a new pocket guide. Our address, Engineering Information, Independent Broadcasting Authority, Crawley Court, Winchester, Hampshire, SO21 2QA. And don't forget to mark your envelopes PG90 if you want a pocket guide. Our telephone number is Winchester, that's 0962 822 444. Office hours are 8.30 to 4.30. At other times, there's an answering machine. Don't forget our link line number at a local rate from anywhere in the country, 0345 078787. Oh, we'll hope you'll join us again next Tuesday. But in the meantime, from Adrian Good and from me, Janet Sorkeld, goodbye from Crawley Court.